This morning, we're going to be examining for the outset of how Jesus Christ fulfilled uh, Scripture. And just to open our minds to it, just think how extensive his fulfillment was. We read in Luke 24 and verse 44, these are the words that I spake unto you when he was with them. He said, all things must needs be fulfilled, which are not talked about, but written down where we all can read, which are written in where? The law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Law, prophets, Psalms considered Christ. The law of Moses, for example, in Deuteronomy 18, verse 18 and 19, Moses says that from among our brethren, meaning from the Jews, God would raise up a prophet like unto me. And you're going to have to hear him and you're going to have to obey him or you will be destroyed. That's Peter's sermon in Acts 3, verses 22 through 23. So Jesus fulfilled what Moses prophesied in his law about him. To pick out one of the prophets, we read it in Isaiah 53, we have a, a total picture of Jesus' ministry, his death, and his life, and how the people reacted to him. He was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. He was one that was despised by the people. They, they hide their face from him. He also took on our infirmities. And, and we all, I know what that is, taking on our, our infirmities, and that means he took on our sins. Hold a minute. The Holy Spirit says in Matthew 8 and verse 17, when Jesus had, when Peter had healed, Jesus had healed Peter's wife, mother, I guess, his wife of, of mother's wife, his wife's mother of, of sickness. He healed a lot of other people too that were lame and fulfilled this passage. That he, he was acquainted with our, our griefs. He took on our our, our our kind of uh, griefs that we have. That was his ministry, not on the cross. Isaiah is a snapshot of what was going to come, and he would fulfill that in his doing his miraculous works. Now, you want to get to his sacrifice? Yes. Verses 10 and 11 will read the fact that indeed he was like a, a sheep led to the slaughter. In Acts 8, 32 through 35, we'll find that the they were reading, the man from Ethiopia was reading from the scriptures, Isaiah, and this passage. And he preached unto him Jesus, Acts 8 and verse 35. Starting from this passage where he would bear our griefs. But Isaiah 53 speaks about his resurrection. That indeed he would be satisfied with that, his death. And would prolong his days. And people would be justified by his sacrifice. And that's exactly what we see in verse 10 and 11, Romans 4. He was delivered up for our transgressions. He was raised, raised, that's, that's being raised from the dead, for our justification. Isaiah says he would justify many. He could justify you, justify me. He justified the people in the days of the apostles. The prophets indeed spoke of the one who was to come, Jesus Christ. And then a passage we're going to be looking in detail this morning is Psalm 22. Not only did the law, not only did the, the prophets, but the psalm spoke of Jesus. And we'll find that we'll be introduced to his agony on the cross, his sanctifying death, and yes, his resurrection will be there. It's amazing to me, as time was cutting down to the coming of Jesus, 1400 B.C., you got Moses writing about the law. You've got, Isaiah, you, you've got indeed the, the prophets such as Isaiah and 750 B.C. writing about, about Jesus. You've got David who in 1000 B.C. So 1400, let's count them down. We're just 1000 years away. We're just 750 years away. And there came one, there came one who fulfill that. I don't know anybody would like to stand where Jesus was and fulfill the prophecies. Do you? Of what he went through? But it was countdown time. And the closer we got to Jesus, he was fulfilling well, Moses. I'll fulfill David's prophecy in the Psalm. And I will fulfill Isaiah. And then 750 years later, Jesus, born of a woman, born under law, 
and went through the things he went through. Isaiah is a good overall shot of his, his ministry, his resurrection, and his death. Psalm 22 gives us an insight into his agony, his agony in death. And that's what I want us to see. It's interesting to me that as Jesus is hanging on the cross, and it comes down to the point of the hours between three, 12 noon and 3 o'clock in the afternoon when he would die. It's at the end of his suffering, and he's about to willingly give up the ghost, that we find him quoting this statement, the beginning of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you, why hast thou, or have you, forsaken me? And what we begin to see there, Jesus started with that. But you're going to see that he knew he was fulfilling the messianic psalm, Psalm 22. Journey with me a little bit. Verse 7 and 8. The Bible says, all that see me laugh me to scorn. They shake their heads, saying, Commit thyself unto Jehovah. Let him deliver him, seeing he delights in him. Let God save him. That's who he is. That's Psalm 22, 7 and 8. Drop down to verse 16. For dogs have compassed me. A company of evildoers have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. We see his agony, what he's going through upon the cross, being scorned and like dogs surrounding him. They got him. He's on the cross. Look at him. Wagging their heads, piercing his hands, and the psalmist says his feet. And then we continue in this psalm, and we say, you know, they part my garments among them. And upon my vesture do they cast lots. Verse 18. It's my garments. I'm the one that's suffering. It's my hands, my feet. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But something happens and changes in Psalm 22. And verse 22 says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, in the midst of the assembly, well, I praise thee. There seems to be a change that's taking place in Psalm 22 that's still part of this torturous first half of this psalm. And right before Jesus' death, he starts with Psalm 22 and verse 1. He could have stopped any one of these and fulfilled them. Start with that one. But this one, in verse 22, things begin to change. And then verse 24 says, For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, meaning God. Neither had he had his, he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he, meaning God, heard. That's verse 24. Well, did Jesus fulfill those? Yes. I think you'll be, you'll be amazed just how completely he fulfilled Psalm 22. My God, my God, thou hast forsaken me. Matthew and Mark both speak of that. It was coming into that era when darkness is upon the earth, and indeed that Jesus is going to die. From 12 to 3, he's on there at time. And Eli, 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 Lama, Sabathani, the Aramaic term, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the terminology. And he is feel, feel, feeling forsaken by God. Just take a note of that, and we're going to come back to it. But we drop down to verse 7 and 8, and we realize, indeed, there was a crowd there. 
Both Matthew and Mark speak about that. But I want you to see about three divisions. First of all, there are the people wagging their heads, just like Psalm 22 said they'd be doing. He said he destroyed the temple and three days he'll raise it up. Come down from the cross. If that's you. Of course, we know they had it all wrong. John 2 verse 21 says he spoke about the temple of his body. Who cares? Got to kill him. He's a blasphemer. It just so happens to be fulfilling Psalm 22 pretty accurately. The scribes, the chief priest, the elders, they come on the scene here and they say, oh, you said you're the son of God. Save yourself. Come down from the cross and we'll believe you. Yeah, they're killing him. You trust in God, let God deliver you. That's kind of like Psalm 22, 7 and 8. They're scorning him. They're mocking him. They laugh him to scorn, Psalmist says. That's not a big stretch. Yeah, Jesus fulfilled that part too. Of what he felt, what agony he was going through. You like to be made fun of? You like to have scorn? Especially when you're dying? For the people that said you blaspheme God and you trusted in God all the time? They're like dogs surrounding me, he says. And they pierced my hands and my feet after Jesus was raised from the dead. He meets with his disciples a week before he showed his disciples his hands and his side, which was the coup de grace after he died of a Roman soldier, some king you are. But he's already dead. Because they came to break the legs so they would die. His legs were not broken because he was dead. The soldier didn't kill him. That was just to finish off because all the mockery is there. They've been closed upon me and pierced my hands. And the psalmist says his feet. But Jesus would show him his hands at his side. Thomas wasn't there. A week later he would come. And he said, until I see that, I will not believe. God, Jesus doesn't ridicule him. He just offered that same evidence a week before to the other apostles. He said, blessed you because you see the other people will not, they don't see, they believe they're going to be blessed. Because this is going to be the basis of saving many people. But at this moment, it's not. It's the feeling of pain in my hands and, and my feet. But after his resurrection, that same body was raised and he could show the evidence of that. He fulfilled Psalm twenty two sixteen two, 16 too, when the, the people did. Unknowingly, they're just trying to kill him. But that was prophesied about this one, that Jesus filled it perfectly. When Jesus looked down from the cross in all of his agony, John 19, verse 23 through 24 gives a more complete picture. Among the soldiers, they divided his garments. Of things like sandals could go and all those things. They, they could divide that. But the vesture, that, that, that covering could not be divided without ruining it. What do they do with that? They cast lots for that. See which way it folds. Oh, you get that part. We won't divide that one up. All the details. Jesus didn't do that. I've got to fulfill prophecy. Why don't y'all do that? <laughs> they did that because he didn't need clothes anymore. They were stripped down to nakedness, to be mocked. Jesus is feeling it. And Psalm 22 helps you go to the cross and realize that this is horrible what he's going through. He did it for you. He did it for me. All of us. Well, Luke 23, 34 tells you how gracious the Lord is. Because at that moment while he's looking down and they're dividing up his clothes, he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 34. Jesus is willingly to be going through this pain of the cross. 
the disgrace of the cross, the laughing, the scorning, as they put him to death. But then it changes. The same one that's experiencing this, I will declare thy name, O God, unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. The Hebrew writer says, uh, that's Jesus. We're looking following his resurrection, which would be, be the basis for our salvation and the glory that's connected with that. The Hebrew writer connects his death. He connects the fact of his resurrection as well. If you turn me to Hebrews, the second chapter, 9 and 12, you begin to see how the Holy Spirit brings this together in the Hebrew writer. Verse 9 says, Behold him who has been made a little lower than the angels, even Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he should taste of death for every man. In the context of his death, conquering Satan, taking away the fear of death, is the fact he was raised with a crown of glory. And so now he could be with his brethren in the midst of the church, in the midst of their understanding. Here's a resurrected Savior we're praising today. And involved, he's involved there. He said, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, will I, will I sing praise unto him? Because of what Jesus did on the cross and was resurrected, that scene could be true and it's, it's reality. And he's in our midst as we offer praises unto God. And we've talked about the cross. we sung about it. We're studying about it. We're remembering it. And that is the, one, that's the only memorial that God gives us. And we, we remember it every week. Why? Because that is the foundation for our salvation. But in verse 24, he says, He hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction. God sees that. And he has not hid his face in all of Jesus' crying before the cross and here on the cross. And when he cried, he heard. Hebrews, the fifth chapter in verse 7, is a remarkable passage. But it's talking about Jesus as well. In verse 7, who in the days of his flesh. Now, this is leading up to the fact that he is going to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. No death here. He's going to be a priest forever. No death is going to keep him from the priesthood of order of Melchizedek. It's after that order. Melchizedek didn't have writings that said, here's the day of his death. Jesus fulfilled it. Exactly right. I died, never to die again, forever. And it's in that context, it says, who in the days of his flesh, that's Jesus, having offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him, who is able to save him from death. That's Gethsemane. Well, let's start there. And having been heard for his godly fear, his prayers were heard when he cried, God did not hide his face from him. He heard his prayers. But he says, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect through the suffering and in this, this context that we're seeing pointing to his resurrection. He made the author of them that obey him, the author of eternal salvation. Without the resurrection, there'll be no salvation. There'll be no resurrection of any death. To me, that's an amazing passage. Oh, I thought, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? <laughs> that's it. God hid his face. He could not stand to look at Jesus Christ on the cross. I'm holy. And all the sins were upon his back. He was the sinner. That's not true. He paid the penalty for our sins. And we have to wrestle with the concept. What, what, why is that? Con he forsook me when Psalm 22 is being fulfilled and that God heard him, heard his prayers, heard his strong crying. He didn't forsake him in that way. 
Well then, how did he forsake him? He left him to die. He didn't change that. He left him to die. It wasn't that he hit his face and I can't, I can't uh, look at you on the cross. I don't think the father took his eyes off of it. He did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He heard his strong crying. What did that be? I'm going to raise you from the dead. Just like we planned. But at that moment, there is the suffering on the cross. Yes, he felt the weight of paying the penalty for sin. But he had no sin on him. He paid the price. The wages of sin is death, and he paid that. But God did not forsake to hear him. And the whole psalm telling you that. Will you read it? For example, we see, Thou art my God since my mother bare me. That's first ten. If God forsook him, Jesus, and I haven't forsaken you, God. I haven't forsaken you, Father. That here I, my mother gave me birth, and thou art my God. You still remain my God. I said, I'm talking to you. My God, my God. And you still are my God. And it's been that way since my mother bared me. That's verse 10. Verse 11. Be not far from me. The trouble is near. Yes, sir. Yes, it is. You're being compassed about by a bunch of evil dogs. And they're going to kill you. I know there is none to help me. There's none to help but you, O oh God. He was forsaken because he feels like he's going to die. He knew he was going to die, and he wasn't going to shy away from it. And he's not delusional on the cross saying these wild things. No. Psalm 22 is being fulfilled. Here's my time of trouble, and I'm going to have to go through this. But you're not going to be sending your 10,000 angels to... You're forsaking me. You're, you're turning against me. You're out turning your back upon me to not save me from the sword. Because I, I, I like to have that salvation. But he said, be not far off. My God, my God, you forsake me. Don't go too far. He just totally turned his back. Don't go too far, O Jehovah. O thou, my sucker, haste thee to my help. He's not giving up in his trust in God. It makes you wonder just what does it mean when he thought that God had forsaken him. Verse 20 and 21, he says, Deliver my soul from the sword. My darling, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. Yea, from the strength or the horns of the wild oxen, thou hast answered me. The dogs killed him that day. He died on the cross like a soldier would die from the sword. As if he was devoured by the, the lion, torn to pieces. And the wild oxen, he said, thou hast answered me. And what we realize is that, yes, you're going to die. I'm forsaking you, not delivering you from death. But look at verse 22. That's where it changes. In the psalm, it changes. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise thee. When he's crowned with the glory. Resurrected body in the glory of sitting as king. His prayers were heard. 
but the experience of death was not avoided. He needed to learn what it meant to be the son of God and made perfect through his suffering. It's in that limited sense that I believe he was forsaken by God, his father. Because if God, his father, could have redeemed him, could have redeemed him from the sword, could redeem you from the dogs. I don't care how strong the oxen are. But he speaks with that as he's about to die. He's fulfilling that. Realize this is what it means. And yes, the weight, knowledge, I'm not saying, well, he had nothing to do with sin. He just, uh, it's all our sins. No, he, he felt the weight, the, the penalty of sin. That's what he bore for us. In bearing our sins, it was the penalty of that. But we get the concept, I can't look at unholiness, and he's, such a, he's, he's full of sin. It's not that. Don't go that route. Psalm 22 doesn't take you down that road. In fact, Psalm 22 is interesting about this idea of delivering him. Psalm 22 and verse 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my groanings. I've got to endure that. You're not coming to my rescue. You're not helping me in that regard. You're going to help me. I haven't forsaken you. Deliver me. That's me crying on the cross. How are you going to deliver? I'm going to raise you from the dead. You will sing praise to my name in the congregation of God's people. I never despise and abhor the affliction of the afflicted. Jesus, I didn't hide my face from you. And yet religious people say it all the time, even our brethren. Why? Scriptures don't lead you there. And what we begin to see is the fact that, no, that's not the case because he's singing praise in Hebrews 2, 9 through 12. And he continues to do that today. With those thoughts in mind, I want to close by offering the invitation. And we sang, Jesus, our a lamb, to bring the scenes of the cross to our mind. You've just had them brought to your mind. And what you're seeing is the fact that he suffered on the cross, the physical pain, but also understanding what it meant. And he had to die for our sins. And here is a servant of God. Isaiah is talking about, well, he bore our sins and that sort of thing. He paid the penalty for our, our sins. That's true. This is how it felt. Psalm 22 tells you how it felt. I want to be delivered from those things, but that wasn't going to be that day in the sense of being, not being crucified by the dogs. But he delivered him. He, he heard his prayer, as the Hebrew writer says. But I want you to listen. Who needs to hear this? Everybody needs to hear it, but especially our young people. Because Psalm 22 ends in verses 30 and 31. After people are going to be worshiping him, these are people that cannot keep his soul alive. We're all going to die. That's not going to change it. We'll, we'll bow our knee in praise to God. Then he says in verse 30, I seed shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord unto the next generation. They shall come and they shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done it. He did what's right to make us righteous. Who needs to hear that? A new generation. Your children, your grandchildren. Our young people here. We grow up as children under a system of law. That's about what we say. Can't do that. I do that. I must do that. Can't do that. If I do that, I'll be good. If you don't do that, I'm bad. 
And they come to the age of accountability. They'll begin to realize that here I'm standing responsible for my God. I've been raised. But what Psalm 22 says, it brings the scenes of the cross before you. I'm asking you, young people, take a look. Look at the cross of Jesus dying upon all the agony that we've looked at, that he fulfilled six areas of thought. Some it didn't, he, he didn't have control over. Some of he felt. Being gaped at, dogs around your cup, I can't get out of this, I'm going to die. They're making fun of me, perverting what I said. And you see that. In Psalm 22, I don't want you to go away from law. The law of the Spirit makes you free from the law of sin and death. And, and law lay down your parents, you've got to keep going that way. But I want you to be introduced to the grace of God in the sense, not that it's without law. The law, grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously in God in this present world. you got rules, young people, as a Christian. And I want to see the grace of God as if it had no rules. That's not the grace of God. But I don't want you to think it's just about doing, not doing, and I'm forgiven. What you're seeing is what Jesus graciously did to save you and me from sin. It wasn't a small price to pay, was it? And I want you to be able to see that with your eyes. What Jesus tasted in his death. Remember Hebrews 2 and verse 9? He tasted of death for all men. For you, if you're 13 years old, 12 years old, thinking about becoming a Christian, I want you to see that this morning. I want you to think about being a Christian. And realize you need to, to make that good confession. Here's your Savior. Here's the agony that he went through willingly. And he's suffering through it. Not he's going to come down from the cross. That's what they challenged him to do. I'm going to die. But he's praying to a father that he never doubted. And a father says, I never quit hearing you. This is how I'm going to answer your prayer. And the psalmist says, he answered me. In the next verse, we have him singing praises in the assembly of God's people. The people who were now justified from their sins. And through his death, I think we all need to see that. Isaac Newton writes a song. If you turn your song books to 157, we're about to sing it. He lived in the 1700s. It took 175 years later for a man to write the tune and to write the chorus of the song we're about to sing. Some of the verses that Isaac Newton wrote are not in our song book, but one that we don't have there, one was changed. He used to sing, he died for such a worm as I. You'll read, the, we'll sing today as, as one not worm. Because we lived in a time where you ain't no trash. We live in a time where we've got to build up your sense of well-being among yourselves. We don't want to trash you. You're not a worm. You're a man. Psalm says, I'm a worm and not a man. The way the people around him were looking at him. And what Isaac Newton was saying, I feel that. I feel that. And I think we've got away from that. I'm just, he died for such a one as I. He felt like a worm, not a man, as they were mocking him, his naked body and all those things. I see that. And we sang, bring that scene before me, O Lamb of God. We just did. What will you do? How will you respond to that? 
One of the verses that Isaac Newton wrote was the fact that bring, allow the cross to appear before my blushing face. I feel godly sorrow for my sins. And you come to that point, your face ought to blush as you go out here and sin and think nothing about it. This is what he did on, on the cross. Turn my heart to thanksgiving as you dissolve my eyes with tears. You ever feel that bad for sin? Look at him. Look at Jesus on the cross. He's tasting death. He's experiencing the most horrible death. And he did it graciously. So you and I could live before God. And we could sing praise to his name today. May that never escape why we worship him. May we keep that before us. May we be better people. And realize, Jesus, I will never forget you on the cross. And realize what all that means. If you're a young person, middle-aged or old, and you need to obey the gospel, we're here to help you. Come as we stand and as we sing.